chronic diseases such as autoimmune encephalitis can affect health-related quality of life, not only for the patients, but also of their families and their caregivers. Today, we are going to hear the story of one of these caregivers, um, which we consider heroes, um, as they go through so much with patients and their loved ones that have a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, today, we are talking to Heidi Bomi, um, whose daughter has a form of autoimmune encephalitis called Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Good afternoon, Heidi. Thank you for sitting down with me today. Hess is anxious to tell the story of the effect of autoimmune encephalitis has on a family and caregivers. You are a mom and a caregiver, which has to be so hard. Uh, yeah, it presents its challenges, that's for sure. <laughs> I bet it does. I have no doubt that it can't be very challenging for you, probably all the time. <laughs> not just part yeah. of the time. Um, yeah. Could you, could you give us a brief description on how um, your daughter Maddie is doing right now? And Sure. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, uh, she has COVID right now. So we just found out last night. So um, that adds a whole nother wrench into things. But other than that, um, she's been doing pretty good. Um, she has just recently gotten on proper treatment um, after been searching for several years for an adult neurologist to treat her and treat her properly. So we kind of, it kind of feels like we're back at the beginning stages of getting her back to healthy. Um, she is not working right now. So for those who aren't, aren't familiar with us or don't know, um, Maddie is 24 years old. Is that right? 24. You sound like yes. me. <laughs> I know. She's either 24 or 25, but I'm pretty sure, pretty sure she's 24. Um, I won't waste the time to do the math right now because that'll take me a while. Um, so uh, she was diagnosed um, when she was 16. Um, so how is she doing right now? She's a 24 year old young woman who lives with her parents. So that, you know, that says a lot right there. Who doesn't like living with their parents? <laughs> well, they want to be we on my own here. Yeah. But, uh, she's an incredibly, she's a firstborn, incredibly independent person. And if she had it her way, she'd be living in a big city in an apartment. Um, doing her own thing. But um, she lives here with us uh, because we are trying to get a grip on her health and get her healthy enough that she can go pursue whatever she wants to do in life. Um, so yeah, she is not working right now. Um, she, she is able to work part-time, a very flexible schedule. Um, but when we started seeing this new neurologist, we live in Iowa, the doctor is in New York. And so we had to do some traveling to get her seen. And we spent some time in the hospital there and then came back and she had to have several different appointments and infusions and things. So she took some time off of work to focus on her health. Um, she's very blessed to work for an amazing company that is um, a small company that's willing to work with her. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, well, we're not in, we're not in a critical situation, um, where things are dire. We're not, everything's not easy peasy. We're kind of somewhere right in the middle, but we're heading towards the right end of the spectrum. So, well, I'm familiar with your story, as you know, um, with Maddie, and I know you yes. guys have gone through some terrible obstacles. Um, in the beginning to get Maddie diagnosed and also as she became an adult to find a mm, neurologist yeah. that would believe in her diagnosis and also to treat her. Um, could you talk about that a little bit for us? <laughs> yes. How long of an interview did we have? <laughs> <laughs> you take as long as you want. Um, yeah. I honestly, it feels like 
the transitioning from pediatric to adult has been an even bigger obstacle than getting her diagnosed in the first place. And maybe I'm just saying that because that's where we're at right now. Um, it took, she had her first seizure spell in March of 2014. Um, she was not diagnosed until August of 2014. So in some ways, you know, when you're living it, it takes a really, that feels like a really long time. In hindsight, I feel like she was really diagnosed relatively quickly compared to the problems we've been having now, just getting her adult care. And um, compared to many others that have gone years. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, we were very blessed. It wasn't that we, you know, we didn't, we didn't have luck the first place we went. And it, I think the most frustrating thing at that time is just when you know there's something wrong with your child and everybody else is writing it off like, oh, it could be psychiatric this. Well, yeah, but people that are high functioning and, you know, are high achievers have problems with these types of things. And when you, in your gut, you know, something is very wrong and nobody's listening. Everybody's writing it off. And um, so we went several places before we found the doctor who finally diagnosed her. And he actually, you know, what a godsend he was because he just told us, I've, I've read about this, but I've never diagnosed it or treated it before. Um, and he was just very honest about, he was researching and trying to figure out what the best options were for us and what kind of treatment to do. Um, yeah, so it was, you know, we were kind of muddling through it together, but we were starting to see improvements with the treatments that he was doing. So we knew we must be on the right path. Um, what a blessing I think, to find a doctor yeah. like that. Yes. You know, like we've learned over the years, um, this doctor was brilliant and he was not only a neurologist, but prior to, he was, he was a little later in life prior to being a neurologist, he was actually a rocket scientist um, and got bored with that and decided to study neurology. So oh my gosh, <laughs> finding a doctor with an inquisitive mind that's constantly wanting to learn, um, I think was, was probably the saving factor there as far as somebody who was willing to look beyond the scope of what they knew to know that there was more information out there, more things out there going on that maybe they hadn't learned about yet. Um, and I think that's the biggest, you know, tying this back to your question, the biggest challenge that we've had transitioning from pediatric to adult care is that because it's so rare, it's very difficult to find doctors that have the most current up-to-date information about it. Um, to just give you an example, the pediatric doctor, when we were transitioning to adult care, referred us to an adult um, neurologist within their same hospital system. Um, and we went to the, you know, first of all, you have to wait a long time to get in to see those people. So you're kind of hanging on by a thread. And when we sat face to face with her in the first appointment, she said, well, I'll just tell you right now, I don't think what you have even exists. I think you've been misdiagnosed. And, you know, it's like, what, how, how can that be? It's and we heard, that, we heard that so many times, either it doesn't exist or if you, this is the other big one, if you really had that, you would be in a coma or you would be in a lot worse shape than you are. And yeah, you just want to smack those people, but <laughs> we have found, I know, <laughs> finding, I think I have come at being on this journey. I've come to respect that doctors that are willing to admit that they don't know something, but they're going to find out are way better doctors and way smarter than those doctors that think that they know it all. Um, those that understand that healthcare is constantly changing evolving, emerging, new things are coming up all the time and they have to stay on the cutting edge of research. Um, those are the best doctors to find. So I have to agree with you on that because um, the ones that, you know, come right out and won't even um, 
you know, research it, you know, or, or, or try to figure out what's going on. They just right away dismiss you. You know, to me, mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's a crime is what it is, you know, for and people. You know, part of the reason why HESA is so important is that we're getting, you're getting information out there in front of doctors. Like here's a prime example. We live in kind of a small town. We have a small town local hospital, but it's actually, it's a pretty good sized hospital um, for our community. Uh, We've always gotten excellent care there. They've always known our family physician happens to be a friend of ours as well. He has always known when he's dealing with something beyond what he understands. And he's always happy to, to send us on to somebody or ask questions. But she went last night to get um, COVID tested because we thought maybe she had it. And the, the doctor that was working urgent care, you know, Maddie explained, I am immune compromised. These are all the meds I'm on. And the doctor said, well, what, what do you have? And when she told her, that doctor had never heard of it. Oh my gosh. Why are doctors coming out of med school? Why are doctors coming out of med school having never heard of this? You know, That's and and back when terrible. she was younger, back when she was younger, um, we made a lot of trips to our local emergency room and to the point where we we got to know the staff there and they knew us very well. Um, and I remember one of the ER doctors saying to us. When, when we finally had a diagnosis, then he would always come in and he'd want to know. And, and I just, again, I have so much respect for that. He would ask us what we had found out, what we were learning, what they were doing to treat her. And he, I remember him saying to us, you know, I vaguely remember hearing about that in med school, but I also remember them saying, you'll probably never see this. So we're not going to spend much time on it. And I thought, hopefully we can change the minds of the medical community to know that you you need to spend time on rare diseases because they're being overlooked because the assumption is is it's so rare you wouldn't have it i agree 100 percent with you 100 percent. they don't i i've had that experience myself with a doctor saying to me that it's so rare that you couldn't possibly have it and um in an ER situation. And that's when you need it the most. You need somebody to really know that you're sick and what you need. And you end up telling them, actually, you educate them. Yeah. Yeah. What you need. Yes. That was, I think we were so fortunate to be in a small town with a small local hospital that the people there knew, like if we were headed to the ER, I would call in and let them know we were on our way because she would be having probably what we know now is to be a limbic seizure. Um, and we would need help getting her from the car into the ER and whatever, but they would, I remember the nurses would always say, what do you need us to do for her? And, and kind of, we were just telling them, Hey, she needs an infusion of steroids or she needs this medication or whatever. Um, and they were always like, that's whatever you say we'll do, you know? So we were very fortunate. I'm not not sure we would have gotten that at a big hospital. So that's amazing though, that they would listen to you and they would actually follow what you are suggesting, you know, because sometimes there's so much ego involved that people do not want to, you know, listen to us lay people, but (laughs) who knows better than the mom, right? Yeah. And I think they had seen her enough to know, you know, a a different ER doc at that time um, who did come from a bigger city and came and worked the weekends in our local ER would say to us each time when we were searching and we still didn't know what was going on, he would say, something is not right here. You keep fighting because something is going on. And he recognized that it was not anything that they were seeing it was not typical of anything else that they were seeing it, that there was something underlying that we needed to press forward on. Cause of course we, we often would get the psychiatric, you know, conversion disorder, uh, you know, you name it, whatever and psychiatric are, condition. And those are the right. Worst. And actually, yes. And actually at one time we were sent to a bigger city to have her admitted to a 10 day psychiatric program. Oh. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, 
that's a story I, I can't tell without getting really upset. But fortunately, fortunately, by the grace of God, we did not sign her over to their care. Um, I, I truly believe in my heart of hearts. Had I signed that paper and she stayed there that she might not be here today because she was in that bad of shape and needed, needed help that bad. But anyway, that's, that's, an, that's another, but and that's, I know that I know that's, I'm sharing that I'm not the only person who's been through it. I was just going to say the exact same thing. I can hear that story from so many different people and the people that have actually had their child put in and, or their loved one put into a psych hospital and couldn't get them out. Yeah. So, you know, um, and they weren't getting the treatment they needed so that um, they just kept getting worse. So it's like a a circle and it's, but just makes me sick. But you also, on the other side of that, at that point in time, we didn't have a diagnosis yet. And so this is where the, the, you know, the whole caregiver mother dichotomy comes in. Um, as her caregiver, I wanted to make sure she was getting the care that she needed. And if that meant signing her over there, I would have needed to do that. So I needed to be able to, as a mother, I'm like, no way in heck I'm leaving her here and driving two hours back home and waiting 10 days till I can talk to her. But I also recognize the fact that I needed to at least open my mind a little bit to the possibility of maybe that's, if that's what she really needs, I have to be strong enough to do it. Do you know what I'm saying? That's um, such because a again, at that, time, at, at that time, we didn't know. Yeah. And it, you know, it was kind of a, a crazy deal. My husband happened to be out of town at that time. And so, and I couldn't get a hold of him because where he was at, he had no cell service. And so just, I remember bearing the weight of, and you know, honestly, I know, you know, as well as to know that our, like my faith is a really big deal to me. Like I was just praying and crying out to God, like you have to show me if I'm supposed to leave her here, I have to know that I know that I know that that's what I'm supposed to do. But if I'm not, I need you to show me that so that I can make the best decision for her care. So I I get, I understand that totally. I've been there with a child that was sick and uh, I understand that faith thing and um, asking for help, (laughs) you know, show me, show me the way I guess is, yeah, you know, exactly the the thing. Um, So all in all, it didn't take you long to get her diagnosed, but it took it, took you longer to get her into an adult neural care. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, part of the problem, the the problem is, you know, there's many layers to this problem and, and it goes, I would say it goes not just for people with autoimmune encephalitis, but anybody with rare disease. Um, I have a friend who has a son about Madison's age that also has extremely rare disease and they were struggling with the same issue. His pediatric doctors really was like, we can't see you anymore. And when you ask where to go, they don't know. And so, you know, we can talk about what should be happening for anybody transitioning from pediatric to adult care. Um, There should be, I mean, my personal opinion is there should be a year or so in there that you have a pediatric doctor and you're still under their care and you're already communicating with an adult doctor and they're working with that pediatric doctor just to start lining up so that the transition happens a little bit over time. But anyway, that's a, that's another sidebar, maybe for another conversation. That's a great idea though. I think that you're right. It should be something like that so that there's not that gap, you know, there's a gap in care. And 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 I see, I see a need for that. Like why, you know, just a random question, but why do children's hospitals not have people assigned to help you do that? You know, that, advocate. that seems like what, well, yeah, for sure. For sure. An advocate that can help you with all that because along with changing to adult care, then comes all new doctors signing orders for insurance. And so even if you are getting good care at that time and you're going to continue to get good care, 
you have different doctors writing orders for scripts that you've fought like heck to get insurance to approve. So you have to start that process all over again with insurance. And sometimes the length of time it takes to get all of that approved then causes a lapse in their treatment and sets you back then, you know, four steps backwards when you were making four, you know. And I was going to ask you, that was one of my questions is that I know even for myself, how tiring it is to try to work around um, getting insurances approved and um, for the care that you need. That has to be such an obstacle for you too. Um, that's a that's almost a full time job. It it is a full time job. <laughs> um, in the sense that you have to make phone calls and you have to be able to answer those phone calls when they call back or else you're back to leaving them a message and waiting for them to, I mean, sometimes it's like just trying to get, make a phone call and get the information you need may take two or three days because you're playing phone tag and nobody can leave a message about the things that you need to talk about. Yeah, it's, I think, um, you know, another great service that could be added at a children's hospital or even an adult hospital is people who are dealing with rare stuff is, education on how to deal with insurance companies. Oh, I and, agree. Um, you know, I now know, thanks to the great community that we found in HESA and the feedback from other parents who had been through similar things, I know the things to say, I know the things to look for, I know how to fight to get meds approved. Because of course, um, because it is so rare and is something that's becoming more common, almost anything they're prescribing for it, it's an off-label use for. Absolutely. And they're expensive medications. Insurance companies don't want to pay for those expensive medications that they don't have to. Oh, so no. it's almost, <laughs> you almost come to the point where you just start assuming I'm going to get a denial and then I'm going to get another denial. So I'm not even going to worry about it until after those things, because it's just, it's part of the game that they play. And you know, they're a business. I get it. They don't want to pay those things. So it is part of a game. But meanwhile, your child or your loved one is not yes. getting the treatment that they need. And you can watch them declining. I mean, I'm sure even with just IVIG, I think, you know, I know Maddie receives IVIG. Um, just from my own experience, if I'm denied for a month or two, I can find myself um slipping down that slope and um, then to build yourself back up, it takes a while. So, and when you're sick, you know, it, for anybody that doesn't have an advocate or a loved one that can help them, you know, when you're sick, trying to get that stuff approved yourself is just almost beyond. Yeah. um, I almost feel like for someone like yourself, who's an adult that has to navigate all those things on your own. There's no way that Maddie could have done that in the state that she was in. Um, So in in a lot of ways, you know, it's very thankful that she was, that this all flared up while she was still a teenager. Um, It's, it's been wonderful is not the word, but it's been so nice. Now she is learning how to advocate for her own healthcare and you know, she's, she's the one lining up doctor's appointments and she's the one that's contacting insurance companies. And, you know, there's still a learning curve in all that process, but she has to be able to learn to do that stuff because heaven forbid someday I might not be here to do it for her. So, and it, and it, when she's she on her own, take care of herself. yeah, yeah, exactly. I get it. Exactly. I get it whole, I get that completely. Um, I was going to ask you to, you know, I know that some of these questions are, you know, kind of tough and personal and I apologize, mm-hmm. but, um, okay. you know, it's gotta be an everyday worry for you. How do, how do you handle my Kleenexes? So I'm ready. I know. Oh no. Oh no. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> no, oh. no, but they're good questions to ask because, um, you feel very alone and, So I want to be real and I want to be honest because somebody else is out there is hopefully going to watch this 
to realize that they're not alone exactly. and the things that they're feeling are not, there's nothing wrong with them that they're feeling this way. Um, so, sorry, I got sidetracked. What exactly was the question? <laughs> how do you, how do you handle day by day, your feelings, your emotions um, with dealing with this? I mean, I know that it's hard and it's gotta be a constant worry in your mind that never leaves. Yeah, so we've been on this journey now for eight years. So my answer today is probably very different than it would have been back when this all first started. Um, because as a mom, you it's not only your child that is sick, you have other kids in your home, you have a husband, you have a household to run, you have other people that rely on you and you can't just abandon everything else for the sake of the one, um, which is, it's a whole nother conversation trying to balance that all out. And, you know, thank God for grace from all of our family members, because the things that I would share with you that are my regrets about that time that I struggle with that make me emotional. Um, I think they would be very, uh, not upset, but I think it would bother them to know that those things bother me. It'd be like, mom, we were fine. We're, we're good, you know, but, but you do wonder about the effect of, of that on other children. Um, how do I, sorry, you asked me, how do I manage the worry? Um, I, it's just a constant conversation in my head to turn it over to God. Um, and some days that's easier than others. Um, some nights when you wake up during the middle of the night, uh, here's a, here's a great, for example. So, you know, she tested positive for COVID last night, whatever I, you know, I'm like, she'll be all right. We caught it really early. You know, she's on some other medications that are going to help her in her fight for that. But I happen to wake up during the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I laid back down in bed and all of the what ifs started popping into my mind. And man, it's sometimes it's really hard in the middle of the night to shut off those voices and those conversations. Um, but yeah, just this constant, I know that I know that I know that God is in control of all of this. I don't always like what it looks like, but I know that he's for us and that he's got this. Um, I feel for those who don't have a solid faith background. Um, and I know that there are some of you out there that are watching this that think maybe, maybe don't, or maybe you have your own thing, uh, whatever, but I, I couldn't have made it through without it. Um, and so whether you get help and support from other family members, from a church, you know, whatever, whatever you do, you can't do this alone. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. You can't do this alone. And if you try to do it alone, you're going to crash and burn. I, I have to say, um, I understand totally that guilt part where you feel like as far as your children and your family, I, I won't go into my situation where um, I was experiencing that, but I was caregiver for someone and um, I felt like I was totally letting everybody else down. I felt like I was not taking care of my children. I felt like my husband was being ignored. I felt like I wasn't, um, I don't even know how to explain it. I wasn't good I wasn't a hundred percent for anybody because I was pulled apart in so many different ways. And, um, it's hard. That's a real hard situation to be in. Yeah. I think, you know, and as, as a, I, I'm speaking specifically as a mother who's a caregiver, um, you're not wor just worried about your own child or the one who's sick. You're worried about your other kids and how it's affecting them. So, things like, um, and your, and your spouse. So I just remember, I remember it being very lonely because there were so many things that I didn't share 
um, let me like, like here's a, for example, um, being several times we would be in a hospital, maybe in Omaha or um, other places, I would go with her and John would stay here with the other kids, A, because he was working and B, because we needed somebody to stay with the kids. But I, I saw and experienced things That you can't explain to anybody. But you can't explain, and I'm not going to try to explain them to John because it's already hard for him that he can't be there, and he's worried about her, and he's worried about me, and he's trying to be the breadwinner of the family, and he's trying to juggle the other kids' activities. And so I just remember feeling like it's not about me, I just have to deal with this stuff. And I, I, you know, I don't think that was a bad decision. Um, no, you carry that burden by yourself though. That's, yes. the, that's the bad part yes. is you're carrying it by yourself and trying to handle it. And, um, I'm the same type of person. So, um, I really, really understand what you're saying. And I, and I never wanted to worry anybody else. So I would keep that yeah. stuff to myself and whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Right. But, and I, you know, fortunately I had a couple of really close friends who were my praying friends that I could like text them. I'm like, I just need you to pray right now. And they were fabulous about that. Um, you also have to be very, I find myself even still um, being very guarded, what I share with who, because how do I want to say this? Those experiences are so fragile and so difficult that I've had situations where I've put them out there to a family member or a close friend, and I didn't get the help I needed. Instead, I got I didn't even want to say unsolicited advice because it wasn't even advice at, at that time, but it made the situation even worse. And you end up more hurt, more upset, more, more, more alone. frustrated, yeah. more alone. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think, I think knowing, knowing who your people are, and even if it's just one, even if it's a small group, and again, you don't want to burden those people with every single little thing, but you do need to know where your safe place is. Um, and there's, it's, yeah. it's, it's so hard because I find part of it has to do with people don't understand what autoimmune encephalitis is. They, mm -hmm. you know, if you said multiple cirrhosis or if you said um, cancer, I hate that word, but yeah, I mean, I if you said something like but that, they would be all over it and they would understand but then because say, people have a frame of reference. Exactly. But when you say autoimmune encephalitis, they have no clue. And so that it doesn't mean anything. I shouldn't say mean anything to them. That's not the right way to put it, but it's, they can't relate to it. So you don't get that, that um, feedback that you need because they just don't understand. And that's where I think the awareness comes in too, not only for the doctors, but for the general public. Mm -hmm. I, I think they need to know for more than just one reason. I, you know, for, of course, for their own health in case something would ever happen, but also for the, just the general knowledge that what's going on for other people. Um, maybe they could help somebody like you in the future if they knew, right, what it right. exactly entailed. Um, right. Well, and it's also, it's really changed. And, and this is, this is where, you know, you take the bad and you, you make something good out of it. It's very much changed the way I respond to other people in difficult situations, whether they've lost someone, whether they're going through a difficult time. I, you know, I used to have that, oh, I feel like I need to say something to make them feel better. And inevitably you end up saying something that makes them feel worse <laughs> instead of better. Um, been there, done that know, one. Just, it, it gets you, 
And, and you learn people mean, well, they're trying, they, they just don't know what to say. And, you know, I think I've learned what I, when I don't know what to say, I just say to them, I don't know what to say, but I love you. And I'm here for you. you know? Yeah. Sometimes I, that's what you need. That's, that's what you need more than anything. I think you're hundred percent right there again, because you just need to know that they're there. If you need anything, um, yeah. they're there for you. They'll listen to you. You need somebody that'll listen. You know, and um, sometimes that's hard to find. Yeah. And, and even, gosh, it's even made me aware of how, like, you know, like sometimes if someone passes away, you, you fix a meal or something and it's like, you feel so helpless, but oh my goodness, what a blessing that was at times where, you know, maybe I had been in the ER with Maddie overnight, all night long, and then got up the next day and had to pull myself together to get to work or whatever, and just had a long, and then someone would show up with a meal that night. And it was like, Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you just want to cry. What, I can't even process what we're going to eat for supper, you know? Yeah. Or just... someone would offer to, to take our, our youngest and take her on a play date or go do something fun with her. And, you know, those things are, That's those are big. very helpful things. That's um, big. Also, as a caregiver and a mother, um, I think this needs to be said. I am not still struggle with asking for help. Um, I'm a very independent person. I Maddie get comes that. by it, honestly. <laughs> I'm a very <laughs> strong person and I don't I don't like I personally I don't like weakness. Now that's not a, a great trait to have. So I've learned these things about myself. It is okay to ask for help. It is okay to get help for yourself. And it's really hard in the midst of something traumatic going on with someone else in your family to acknowledge that you need help yourself. That doesn't mean that you're you're saying your situation is worse than theirs. It's not saying, it's not trying to divert the attention to yourself. It's okay. If I can say anything, anybody who's listening, it's okay to ask for help and help might be offering to bring a meal. Help might be taking your kids for the night so you can go to bed early. Help might be offering to, I don't know, you know, Offering to anything. clean your house. Yeah. I mean, anything, anything is helpful. I, I, again, know what you're talking about because I'm also like that. Um, somebody called me a stubborn Irish woman, but that basically <laughs> is what I am. And I yeah. have a hard time asking for help. I've gotten better um, since I kind of on my own here, but um, it was so hard. I would just rather keep it all internally and not ask for any help um, emotionally, physically, um, whatever it was, I didn't want to ask. Um, I was brought up by my mother who was very much the same, you know, um, strong and independent and um, just strength beyond belief. And um I ended up the same way. And I think Maddie's turned out the same way too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We still battle that at times. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because I was, I will make this comment all the time and I know she's going to see this. So um, <laughs> she was a strong willed little girl um, and she and I also am strong willed. So we butted heads a lot, but I look back on everything and there's a reason why she was born with those qualities. And there is a reason why I was born with the qualities that I have. And I'm, I am learning as in still in the process of learning that real strength is knowing when you need help I and agree. knowing when you can't do it. And it's taken me a long time to figure that out. Um, admitting you don't know something and this, you know, this also ties back into doctors, if there's any doctors that are watching this, <laughs> real strength is knowing when to say, I don't know, or I can't do this. I need to get help, you know? And like I said, the best doctors we've had over the years, 
are the ones that said either this, even, even if you say, I don't know this well enough to help you. And, you know, we had a doctor uh, from Des Moines once that did that. And it broke our heart because he was such a personal little guy and we had heard so many good things about him. But I really respect the fact that he was, had the humility to say, I don't know what to do for you. You know, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's knowing when to ask for help is a big one. That's very big. And um, yeah, I used to, I'm pretty religious, like you're saying, and a lot of people aren't, and that's okay too. It's whatever makes people um, work. But I remember I praying. Too. I was just going to say, I just remember praying and saying, please, God, just let me be able to handle what you're giving me. And also let me handle the fact that I need help. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. need help I think from it, others. I think it happens, especially, you know, when you're on such a long journey, you know, eight years, a of, long time of long needing time. help, you know, and you get, you get tired of asking for help. You get tired of, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I appreciate the people still are concerned about Maddie and worried about her and whatever, but I just want to go to Walmart and not talk about it. <laughs> you know? Oh my in, gosh. In a, I get it. In a town, it. in a town this size, that doesn't happen, you know? And, and again, thank God that people care. Um, but yeah, sometimes it would be nice to have someone go get, pick up your groceries for you. So you didn't have to answer a million questions when you're in the middle of a crisis. So anyway. I, I understand that because, uh, again, going through things in my life and everywhere I went, you know, people would stop me and say, Hey, how's, you know, and it's like, I don't want to, I just want to forget for a little yeah. bit. I just know? need to go get my groceries and get home without crying. <laughs> exactly. Cause every time you start talking about it, of course yeah. the emotions come right up, you know, and, yeah. uh, it's hard. I, you know, Heidi, how, how has this whole adventure that you've gone through with Maddie affected your own health? Um, well, I mean, I'm healthy. I'm fine. Um, I think anybody that goes through something like this, your own health and well-being takes a backseat to everybody else's. Um, I, so I, but I want to preface this with saying I worked part-time. We were very blessed when the kids were little, I was a stay-at-home mom. So my husband has always worked a job where he could support our family. When the kids were all in school, I subbed at the school and I worked part-time more for something to do than necessarily that I had to have that income to support our family. Um, when things got really bad, I was able to quit working and stay home. And you know, we got to the point where she, she couldn't be left alone. So someone had to be home 24 seven. So I, um, I'm saying all this in the sense of, I was probably able to take better care of myself than someone who is juggling a sick child and a job and insurance and, you know, and all of those things. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't easy just because it wasn't like I was sitting at home eating bonbons and watching soap operas all day by any means. Um, but it did give me, there were times carved out that I could take a nap or get the rest that I needed or get my cup filled with, you know, maybe a friend would bring over coffee because they knew I couldn't leave. And so you get a chance to do the things that you need to keep yourself healthy. Um, that's great. That's good to so, know. That's great. Cause that, that stress can cause a lot of issues. Yeah. You know, um, for people that are going through it, it, um, even later on in life, it can cause issues, um, from going through it earlier in life. <laughs> sure, um, sure. I was going to yeah. ask you if there's anything else that you feel you'd like to bring to people's attention. Anything else you'd like to say before we close? 
Um, well, I think this kind of ties into what I talked about earlier, but the importance of community. Um, we found Hessa after she had been diagnosed and there was very little information anywhere. Um, I highly recommend if you, if you know someone with autoimmune encephalitis or Hashimoto's encephalopathy or whatever street, whatever we're going to call it, um, read the book, read the book, read the book, read the book. Um, it gave me insight into what was going on in Maddie's world. Things that looked like, um, it looks psychiatric. I mean, on top of the seizures and everything, there were extreme mood disorders. There were, there were some ugly, ugly, and I love you, Maddie, because I know you're going to see us, but there were some ugly personalities that came out. Um, not knowing as her mom, I remember having a conversation once with a therapist about, I'm trying to juggle as a mom with her treating me poorly, do you discipline for that? Or do you let it go? Because if she can't help it, I don't wanna discipline her for it, but if she's just in a really bad mood and she's being crappy to me, it's not okay either. You know, and well, that's trying a to, great question. to navigate all that stuff, trying to navigate all of that stuff. Um, now, now in hindsight, being able to read the book, was very helpful to know that this is not, if it's not consistent with their personality, it's not her, you know? Um, being in the Facebook groups and the online communities um, within, I, I will say uh, I have to, within reason, um, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole and get lost forever in that kind of stuff. So I think you have to know for yourself, your own balance of, um, being able to get advice and ask questions and gain insight um, from the people in the Facebook groups and also to know like, okay, well, this is, this is where I listen to that. And then this is where I jump off this conversation. Absolutely. You know, I don't know if that makes, I don't know if that no. makes sense. I think, and I think that's a good rule for any Facebook conversation in general. Just I just agree. Saying. I agree a hundred percent. But I, I think you can also get overwhelmed with too much information. So extrapolate the information that is helpful for you. And then. Exactly. And I also sometimes um, think that if, if you, it's not all negative. I mean, some of it's some really positive information oh, sure. where, you know, I just had a contact with somebody that um, was in our very first Facebook group and uh, I hadn't heard from them for quite a while. And he said to me, he emailed me and he said, Susie, he said, I've been in remission for four years. And it's like, well, you know, go sign back into the Facebook groups, tell people because they need that positive story. Yes. Too. You know, yeah. they need to know that yeah. it's not all negative, that there's positive out there too. And um, he did, yeah. I did see that he signed back in and I was so glad because um there's just so much sadness and, and um, hopelessness sometimes when you're diagnosed or you're a caregiver taking care of someone. And to read that there's hope, you know, somebody can actually. Yes. And that's an important, important reminder is as people will be watching this probably in a Facebook group or whatever, that we need to post the good stuff too. Um, I remember, so we have a, parents of children with autoimmune encephalitis group, which probably you're not a part of, but um, one thing that's really hard is like, you will have a parent or, you know, mom or dad or whatever that's struggling and they post to find help with your kid. And it's like PTSD. It takes you right back. And, and I've even struggled with someone will reach out to me through Facebook message. And, and I have no problem offering help to anybody that I can, but you really have to protect yourself. It, it's just, it's amazing. Sometimes I hear something that a parent of maybe a child that's not been diagnosed yet or whatever, I hear something about that and it will just, it will emotionally take you right back to that point in time. And it's like, I can't afford to go there right now. You know, I'm not, 
I'm not in a place where I can, not that I'm not saying that I can't help that person, but you just really have to protect yourself. I understand totally. Not to go down that rabbit hole again. Um, No, you have to So you were asking me, yeah, community is so, so important. And, And again, I can't imagine had we dealt with this even 10 years ago before, I mean, I don't know how long Facebook's been around or, you know, Zoom calls or whatever, um, we would feel like we were on an island all by ourselves. And we would probably would really question, does it really exist? Or are we barking up the wrong tree? But when you start hearing, I think, you know, reading the book, there were similarities in some of the people's stories. So I knew Yes, we're on to the right thing. Um, Talking in the Facebook groups, people that were having similar issues, similar circumstances, um, just helps you to know, yes, maybe this is the right thing. Or maybe if you're struggling to figure out what's going on, you might be able to say, you know, I don't think this is it. I can move on to something else. And I thank you for saying that about the book. Um, The book was definitely the reason to write the book was more so for the patient stories, just what you were saying, Mm -hmm. so that people could read other people's stories and know that they're not alone. Because there's, like you said, there's some crossover similarities, yet everyone's is different. But um, sometimes you read them and you think, oh my God, that's me. I can't believe it. And when I was diagnosed was 2011, And at that time, there was only supposedly 200 cases known of HE. And um, I was lucky enough to find my partner in crime to start the HESA Foundation. Um, And when she told me she was diagnosed also, I was like, what? (laughs) You know, and that that was the beginning of the beginning. And um, but I went to had that without a group to go to and ask, and um, it can really help people. But like, you're right, you have to be a little guarded to know Mm -hmm. what to take from it and what not to. But I, you know, I know we should probably end this and I wanna really, really thank you for sitting down with us today and discussing this. And uh, I know what you have said is gonna help a lot of different people. I can see it, I can hear it. Um, And that's what it's all about. And to also bring awareness of how hard it is for the caregivers and for the family um, when you're dealing with a patient that has AE. And um, I can't thank you enough, um, Heidi. Thank you so much. And yeah, and thank you too, Susan, for bringing some of this to light because I do, you know, I, I don't mean this as in like, oh, woe is me, poor caregiver. Nobody gets how hard it is. But if you aren't one, you don't get it. You just don't, don't. you know, and um, you don't get it for the children. You know, if you're a sibling of someone who's struggling, you don't get it if you're a parent, you know, just all those things. I, so the more conversations like this we have, the better, the better I agree. I agree. And it's, and it's not just caregivers for AE. I mean, we're about that right now. But any caregiver for somebody who's got um, right. long-term illness and um, or chronic illness, it's so hard on the other person involved, the caregiver, the loved one, and people don't recognize it. Like you just said, siblings, loved ones, they don't, they don't understand that. Uh, I, I always say you guys are unsung heroes because you don't get enough credit and yet you're taking care of what's more important in life than a loved one that's mm-hmm. sick. Right. I mean, really? So bless your heart. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on Susan. You know how much I love you guys. And well, uh, and we think so much it's of meant. <laughs> and, and Maddie, you know that. So thank you again yep. and have a nice rest of the day. Have a cup of coffee. I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Bye now, Heidi. Bye Good. Susan.